multi-species rotational grazing. What is it? And is it something that you can apply to your property on the small homestead scale? I've had a lot of questions lately about multi-species rotational grazing and what we're doing here on our homestead at Riverbend. What I'm hearing is a lot of people aren't sure if it's something that they can apply on the homestead scale. And that maybe, hey, that's great for big grazers that have a whole lot of land and a lot of animals and can have, you know, all the diversity and all the fencing and all the different things that go into it. And now yeah, maybe that doesn't really apply to me, but I wish it did. I want to tell you that multi-species rotational grazing uh, can apply just about any property. Certainly, you generally need a few acres of land. We're on three and a half acres right here, and we're actually doing quite a bit right here. And you could do a bit yourself, even on a smaller piece of property in the right conditions. And of course, it can scale up from a couple acres to 10, 20 acres, up to thousands of acres. But we're talking homestead scale. Let's tackle the rotational grazing first. And rotational grazing is exactly what it sounds like, right? It is rotating animals through your pasture. And you might say, well, my animals rotate themselves through the pasture. They're out there. I see them moving around, walking around. Well, what your animals tend to do is they tend to go find their favorite forages, their favorite grasses, dessert, if you will, the, the, the best. And they're gonna eat those high quality plants down and diminish them. What you're also doing is reducing the root mass below the ground of that plant. That plant has to slough off those roots and that decomposes and goes into the soil. In a controlled manner, that can be a good thing, but when it's not controlled, the plants get continually grazed, the root bases get shortened, the grasses can't grow, and, and the animals ignore some of the other uh, forages out there. Things start to get out of balance. Well, when you bring in rotational grazing, some people call it management intensive grazing. And so we're then moving the animals around to control what they're eating. We're, we're essentially giving them their food for the day. The best way to do this is definitely daily rotations. You, you can change those rotations, do them less often. Sometimes people do them twice a day and you're able to control what they eat so that not only do they eat the good stuff, the stuff that they really want, right? Uh, just like your kids do when they sit down to a plate of dinner, they tend to go and get the things they're really excited about first. And then you gotta kind of say, no, 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 you need to eat the vegetables too. You need to clear your plate. Well, in rotational grazing, you're creating a defined space, a paddock or a cell, and you're allotting them a certain amount for the day. That helps them eat more evenly, eat the things that you want them to eat, that they want to eat and some of the other things that maybe they don't want to eat, but that also controls it so that they're not overeating everything. You're moving them on the next day. And that starts to create some balance in your pasture so that you leave things tall enough. You don't want your grasses ever eaten down too short if you can help it. Three is about the shortest you'd ever want to go. I like to see four to six inches because that's keeping the ground cover, that's shading the ground. That's leaving enough solar panel on that plant so that it can continue to grow back uh, at a decent pace. You're not cutting it off so much that it's really stunted and it takes months for it to recover, right? It has been proven that you can improve usage of your land and production by around 25% using rotational grazing. It's, it's very, very effective. So you're gonna be able to do more with your land. And I, I think over time, 25% is probably a low number if you're managing well. Let's talk about the multi-species aspect. Again, multi-species is just what it sounds like. It's more than one species. Now, can you do rotational grazing with just one species? Absolutely, you can. You could just have 
cows out here. You could just have sheep out here. You could just have chickens out here. You can see I've got some, some grazing pigs, some cooney coonies out here. You could do any of those as a single species and apply rotational grazing for you and it would work and it is a benefit and I would encourage you to do that. But nature doesn't work in mono systems, mono cultures, mono crops. Nature is always diverse and so when we bring in multi-species just like out there in our forages or in our gardens or in our orchards, we want a diversity of species. There's always a benefit and resiliency to having multiple species. And so if you can do at least two, there's a huge benefit. The common combination is the ruminant and the bird. That is one you see commonly in nature. You would have seen that in the American prairies with the buffalo and the birds. You see it in the African savannas and lots of different places. Birds tend to follow ruminants. What are we generally trying to do on the homestead? We're usually raising some chickens, maybe some turkeys, some geese. We have all of those out here. And we're usually raising some ruminants, being a dairy cow or beef cow or some sheep. That is a very, very natural multi-species combination that you can do. Those birds are like the sanitizing crew, the cleanup crew. They're coming behind and cleaning up bugs and parasites and a lot of the other things that we don't want. So the birds are very, very powerful and effective to have out here moving around with the animals. They're gonna, they're gonna break up the cow patties. They're gonna spread that manure out. They're gonna eat the fly larva that comes in there so it feeds the chickens, reduces your bug population. And the chickens also are spreading their manure. And so I like to do them in paddocks as well, behind the ruminants. You can do lots of different combinations in the multi-species. Right now out here we have sheep in the lead out front we're just turning a corner in our lanes we have uh, cooney cooney pigs that do well on all grass and they do not root so i've got my boar and two sows out here hopefully we're getting some breeding taken care of and then we've got our egg layers following behind so that is a uh, a three species rotation i would have had the dairy cow out here and i will here probably in the next 30 days uh, don't right now simply because our dairy cow came up empty and we've been shopping for another dairy cow But we will end up with her out front as well Another thing that happens say like with the cows and the sheep the cows and the sheep are dead-end hosts as far as parasites and There are things that the sheep prefer that the cow doesn't really like and there are things that the cow prefers that the sheep don't really like so you're also making a very good use of forage in those multi-species Let's talk about the pigs for a moment. You've got to be careful with pigs this is just my second season of bringing these pigs out here, these cooney coonies. They don't root. I wouldn't want rooting pigs on this pasture. I don't want this pasture turned up. It's one of the reasons I have the coonies, and that's kind of a whole other subject, but uh, they're easy keepers, and they will live on the grass and in the winter on the food scraps from the kitchen and a little fodder or a little grain, and so they're very resilient. And I found that they're kind of like the sheep. They will eat a lot of the things that the cows won't eat. So very, very beneficial. And you can figure out what works for you as far as multi-species. One of the rules of thumb, ruminants are always out in front, highest demand. So if you have a dairy cow, you want the dairy cow out in front, she's gonna get free choice of the best forage out there. Then you'd run maybe your beef cow, or your sheep behind them. If you've got omnivores behind pigs, they're gonna come behind the ruminants. And then the birds, they're gonna be the cleanup crew and they're gonna be follow behind. And you want to stay with that order in your rotation. That is going to help minimize parasites, make best use of the forage. Let's talk about manure. What's really, really powerful here is the fertilization that is happening. This is why this really begins to boost production. There's been some studies and adding just sheep to cows and that multi-species combination, I think increases, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing from memory here, but nine to 10% or more uh, just in that combination. Uh, of animal and the dynamics that goes on there. So again, you're now stacking this multi-species on top of the rotational grazing and done well, you are just accelerating the health of your pasture. And the big component of that is 
fertilizer. Every single one of those animals is laying down fertilizer for free for you. They're cycling that nutrient, taking what their body needs, obviously, sp spitting out the rest, right? And putting it on the ground and fertilizing your pasture. That is a lot. A cow will do 50 pounds a day or more of manure or urine. It takes about, um, I think, 10 sheep to do that much. Two other things I wanna talk about, how much land do you need and, and fencing. How much land is, that? that's the big unknown question. Where do you live? What kind of land do you have? How, how much moisture do you get? There's a rule of thumb that I've gone by that I read from one of the main grazers. I think it was Jim Garrish and I'm paraphrasing here. If you're less than 10 inches of moisture a year, you're probably gonna have a hard time grazing much of anything unless you've got additional water to add in. 10 inches a year up to about 25 inches a year, about one pass per 10 inches of rainfall. So one rotation. So if you had 10 inches, you're probably gonna get about one ro rotation across your pasture in a season considering your pasture is average and normal. Say you got 25 inches of rain a year, you could figure that you might get about two and a half rotations. I think that's a good starting place. And once you get up to about 30 inches a year, you can take those, those rotations instead of 10 inches of moisture per rotation down to about seven inches of moisture per rotation. So say you got 30 inches, that's uh, four rotations would be 28 inches of moisture. So at 30, you know, 35, you're gonna get four to five rotations a year. Again, assuming your pasture is all in, you know, good condition to start with. If it's not, then, then you know, there's some other things to work in. But these are some rules of thumb to help you, you know, understand what you can do. So in an in a average rain environment, may say 30, 40 inches a year, you could do quite a bit on a few acres. Fencing is a whole nother large subject, but what makes this work in the modern context is electrical fencing. In the old days, in the bigger environments, uh, the wild herds, they moved around, they rotated themselves. They, they, had, they had the world wide open and they could move and just follow the best forages with the season. When there was shepherds, the shepherds would move their flocks accordingly to water, to shade, and to the best forages, and they would rotate them around to maintain their pastures. Well, we have fences everywhere today, and we have a lot of people wanting to do this on smaller acreage, and so electrical fencing is what makes this work. I also know it's one of the barriers for people because it's seen as expensive, and it is a cost, it is an investment to have the electrical fencing, but it's what makes this work, and the benefit is well worth the cost. What kind of fencing is going to depend on what kind of animals uh, you are running and how you are managing. So we have a diversity of different fences. We've got everywhere from just single wire poly braided electrical fencing that will keep cows in just fine, all the way up to netting. I do netting out here for a variety of reasons. So we have, if you can see, we have long lanes kind of going somewhat on contour across the pasture. This just keeps everybody in. It's really not much more work. It is a little more investment than some other fencing, but because I'm doing such a variety of animals and I want my chickens not free ranging, but I want them in the paddock following up, I'm going with mostly netting on this scale. If this got too much bigger, it probably you know wouldn't be worth the cost and we'd, we'd want to go to more single wire poly and let the chickens free range or just move them in tractors a little bit more often, you know, some different strategies. And it's one where there's not just a right answer, you have to find the right answer for you. One of the easiest places to start is cows. A single wire can keep a dairy cow in. That is not very expensive and it's very easy to put up, take down, move around. You do that and then put some chickens behind it. And don't worry about keeping them fenced in. I know I'm saying for my situation, I'm doing that because I really want to control the manure and that's useful, but you don't have to do that. And you can get, let the chickens free range if you've got an environment, you're not too worried about predators or you've got a dog out there. You could just have a cow, a dairy cow and some chickens. That is a great starting place if you've say got a few acres. And then from there, you can look at what it takes to introduce other animals, um, after you've gotten your skills down and, and you've worked with the fencing. That's multi-species 
rotational grazing. It's just bringing multiple species in. We're mimicking nature. Nature does not do monocrops, mono anything, and nor does nature in the natural environment just coop up animals and keep them in one place. Even if it's a large place, even if you have a lot of acres and only a couple of animals, they're still going to deteriorate the pasture and you know run over the best areas and which is going to cause those best forages to decrease and the forages you don't want to increase and over the long haul that's going to deteriorate your land and it's going to deteriorate your harvest which ultimately deteriorates your resiliency and your ability to provide nutrient dense food for yourself your family and your community uh, while degrading your land and that's not where we want to go so multi-species rotational grazing it is for the homesteader. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and I will see you soon. Adios.